So we're on Route 7 on the way to Bergen. Just done a massive climb up to the top of this kind of mountainous area. There's four tunnels you can go through. I looked on the map and there's little side routes around each of them. I thought, perfect. Just go around the side of them. Get to the first tunnel, side route, blocked off. Can't go down it. I have to go through the tunnel, but cyclists can go through the tunnel. There's no sign saying you can't. Go through the tunnel. Not ideal. Pretty f***ing scary. Cars whizzing past you. When a car is behind you and it's coming up, it sounds like a f***ing rocket in the, in the tunnel because the echo and how the noise vibrates. Yeah, you don't know if it's a bus, truck, if it's just a car. Flying past you. Done two. Scary as hell. I've got two more to go. My God, this is the scariest part of the trip so far. There was no other option but to take this route. There was no other route. So that's the problem with the mountainous areas of Norway. You've got one road. One road only. Um, top of my list though. Go on. Norway. Good choice, my friend. Hello, my name is Matthew, and this is my home, Oslo, the capital of Norway. And this is my back garden. Norway is blessed with just seemingly endless amounts of nature. When I first came to this country, I took the famous Oslo to Bergen rail journey, which according to Google, is the best rail journey in the world. It crosses the largest mountain range in Northern Europe, past glaciers, rivers, lakes, forests, and long deep fjords. They're all on for show. But that does beg the question, what's it like to cycle the journey? An unpredictable climate. What a day. A few busy roads. some long, dark tunnels. Might dampen your spirits a little bit. But cycling is so much more than a mode of transport. It's an adventure. To leave your city behind and to explore new roads and paths. It's a feeling of freedom. The exhilaration. Perseverance. Oh. Right when the sun is shining. Many ups. It bollocks to this. And downs. This journey sets out to capture that very essence of what it's like to cycle in Norway. I've, Norway. Not, I've not been there, but I, I really want to go there. Now you could do this over three to four days comfortably, sticking to the main roads. But we're going to go off-road for a little bit. So we're going to give ourselves five full days and two half days. Day one, a half day. The aim was simple, to reach the outskirts of the population area of Oslo Fjord, passing through Sandvika, Asker, Dudamen, and arriving in Hoxton, the last town before the vast open road greets us. Day two, we go through the forests on gravel paths, experiencing many small climbs and descents, and finally camping at the foot of where the challenging mountains begin. Day three, the real climbing starts with three mountains to summit and descend before reaching the largest mountain plateau in Northern Europe. In day four, we take the roller iron, an old rail service road, through and over the mountain plateau. Day five, we descend down the valley and on towards Hadanga, 
one of Norway's longest and deepest fjords. Day six, we follow the fjord along and then cross back over to the north side where we head over another mountain plateau before descending down towards Bergen. And finally, day seven, a leisurely 20 kilometer ride into Bergen and up to the summit of Mount Fluyen. This is Norway. This is its awe-inspiring terrain. Now to tackle this awesome terrain, I needed a bike that could handle the extremes of Norway's off-road mountain routes, but at the same time could be fast and perform well on the flats and descents of the open roads. Introducing the Canyon Grail, the ultimate all-round bike. It felt like this bike was built especially for the Norwegian terrain, and it did not disappoint in any way. Reliable, confident, and nearly as beautiful as the girls that live here. I cannot recommend this bike enough. Now Norway has a population of just over 5 million people and most of them live in the towns and cities that surround the coastal regions of this seafaring nation. Once you start heading inland, it gets very quiet very quickly. And before you know it, you're on your own. This is the last saloon before we head towards Norway's vast inland forests. Day two, on the way to Bergen. No idea where I am right now. In the middle of absolute nowhere. Nearly ran over. A snake. Look at this little bad boy. See it? Oh, it's moving. climbed all the way up to the top of this forest it just seems like it's taken for ages it's been unbelievably hard we've done 50k so far today i've been on the road for three and a half hours so remarkably slow progress but very very difficult terrain I'm just hoping now i'm gonna have a nice descent cool air it's so fucking warm it's unbelievable it's so humid i'm just sweating like mad bad. Gonna head down here now. We've got 60 k's or so, maybe less. The campsite. That descent was just crazy. It went on for ages. Very nice. Didn't realize how high I was. But that was some serious climbing. But nice to come down. All right, flat road ahead. Let's see where it takes us. day two 120 kilometers today incredibly tough weather was ridiculously warm but incredibly beautiful amazing journey through the forest ups and downs pretty tired now found a nice little campsite yes you have a little tent okay. little tent yes okay yeah Special for you, 100 corn. Oh, amazing. 
100 kroners. The guy gave me two, two cokes for free because I cycled so far. <laughs> what a nice guy. And a little lake to swim in. Onwards and upwards tomorrow. Day three coming up. Day three started off really magical, but then. And it got worse. And worse. But come rain or shine, we had a mission to complete. Three mountains, three climbs, three descents. Gradients between 6 to 10%, with the highest mountain 1,100 meters above sea level. This was it. Seven kilometers climb to begin with. Let's do this. That's the first one done. Two to go. Down we went. And back up we go. Down again we go. And going up, up, up. And finally, back down we went. I wasn't expecting this cold. When we arrived in Yilo, we had a little break. Had a cup of tea. Nipped into the sports shop. Got ourselves some leg warmers. Back on the road we went. This time, we were on road number seven. This is the main road, and it's a busy road. Now you can take this road all the way to Bergen, and it is very scenic along the way. And if you're interested, it's also part of the Norseman Extreme Triathlon route. But there are some tunnels, and it can be busy in places. So we're going to veer off in a few kilometers time and head through the mountains tomorrow. But we will rejoin this road at some point and unfortunately it will be considerably worse. After 23 kilometers on road 7 and 84 kilometers in total for the day, I finally reached my destination, Haugastuhl. Stayed in a little hotel there because the weather was so bad. They did fantastic food, I highly recommend it. And prepared myself for day number 4. I know it was going to be cold again. They went down to 8 degrees during the evening. So I was expecting a pretty cold day through the mountains on day 4. But also quite an exciting one. Let's see what happens. Morning. My goodness. What a day. A lot of rain. A lot of rain. Did I didn't mention there's going to be a lot of rain? We're in the mountains. We are 1,000 meters above sea level. A little bit of rain won't kill me. And it's all part of the fun. So after three days of being on roads with traffic, it is huge amounts of fun to get off road, to push hard, like to really test your bike out. And the first 30 kilometers of this road through the mountains, it does not disappoint. It is huge amounts of fun. After you reach the area of Finsa, the road starts to deteriorate a little bit. You have to slow down. So the further you get into the mountains, the road conditions start to get more rocky, more uneven, but you have it all to yourself. Well, it felt like I had it all to myself, and it's just really, really epic going through the mountains on a bike, on your own, above a thousand meters. How cool is that?
It is cold. It's so fucking warm. My hands are pretty numb. Well, it's so humid. I'm just sweating like my feet are definitely numb. We're in the mountains. What do you expect? So, here we are at the highest point of the journey. 1,003 meters above sea level. We've got about 15 k to go before we're going to reach this hitter that we're going to stay at tonight. Just ride out this weather. Tomorrow it's going to clear up and by tomorrow afternoon we should have some sunshine and then hopefully some fantastic views down to Bergen. Good morning, here we are, day five, and the sun has returned. Look at this place. Death by Digger. What a day. <laughs> oh my. What a view. What a view. Fuck me. Wow. Well, what a morning. I wasn't expecting it to be this good this morning. I knew it was going to get better during the day, but my God, so lucky. Really getting to experience the mountains now, the blue sky, everything just looks so much better. You've got such great views across the valley, through the mountains. Look at this, this is what I'm riding through. Every turn, every corner you go around, just breathtaking. Hello, Norway. Whoa. Carry on. <laughs> but a few more minutes at least. Alright. Leg warmers are off. Legs are back in play. Sunscreen is on. We've just come from up there. And now we're heading this way. Doesn't get much better than this. Let's go. Sadly, this amazing road comes to an end at a place called Myrdal. And it doesn't begin again until you reach a place called Upsetter. And in between, there is a mountain range. Now you have two options. One, I can pick up my 20 kilo bike and carry it through the mountains. It's about nine kilometers walk, and it will probably take me around four hours plus carrying a bike. The other option is I take a three minute train journey through the mountain via a tunnel. So either carrying a 20 kilo bike for four hours or a three minute train journey. 
That is a tough decision and it was a hard one to make. Now I foolishly thought that once we'd left the Mountain Plata region and started to head through the valley that perhaps the, the scenery would not be as spectacular. And what I can say is that from Upsetter to Voss it is just as amazing as it was going through the mountains. I was pleasantly surprised, in fact I was overwhelmed with how incredible this part of the journey is. After two days in the mountains, we're back onto paved roads. Rock and roll. Boss, 39 kilometers away. Let's do this. To be honest with you, I could have played the whole of this footage from Upsetter to Voss. I've cut it a lot, so you just get small kind of glimpses into this journey. But I can tell you right now that if you ever get the chance, you must do this trip. There is no cars, no traffic, the road is yours, and my god, is it spectacular. With every passing day there's more, calling you out, out to explore, get up and go. There is joy found in the race, and I feel So here we are at Voss. It's so weird, I've just come down the mountain through the valley it's just been absolutely spectacular and then all of a sudden I just come to a road and here I am in Voss back into civilization after two days of being in the mountains it's crazy all of a sudden there's just cars everywhere and people and buildings and stuff and I'm like oh, don't really want to be here I want to be back living free and I was meant to be living free living free living free and I was meant to be I'm living free living free living free and I was meant to be free so as you may have seen I was a little bit sad after finishing that amazing journey down to Voss and I thought that the road to Herdanga was going to be busy I wasn't really looking forward to it and uh, I was once again completely pleasantly surprised and I'm going around these incredible hairpin corners and I go around the first one and okay this is how it's going to be is it it's that first time you do something when you, you don't know what to expect, ignorance is kind of bliss and it's that feeling of just experiencing all this for the first time which just makes it so magical. And of course I was descending at speed, I didn't want to stop, I just wanted to continue because I was just enjoying the moment on the bike. And then I thought well surely it can't get any better now. And then I arrived at Hadanga and it's like being hit over the head with a rainbow, the beauty it's it's beginning to hurt now however within just a few minutes i was taken from heaven directly to hell as i entered my first tunnel of the journey a tunnel to a cyclist is like kryptonite to superman you want to keep well away but norway has over 1100 tunnels which means if you're going to go to Bergen, inevitably you're going to have to go through some. The first thing you notice is how loud it is in the tunnels. Then you've got the claustrophobic feeling. It's cold. They're usually very dark. And worst of all, some of them feel incredibly unsafe to cycle through. All I can say is... Oh! My God! Look at that! Yeah, that's But with the exception of that tunnel, 
this day had been magical. When I reached the south side, I continued cycling for about another 10 to 15 kilometers, and then I came across a nice little campsite. And that was the day over. I was very much looking forward to day six. I knew it was going to be a beautiful ride along Padanga, but of course, I had no idea what was in store for me. I'll take my chances and then go through the tunnel, that's for sure. Yesterday was incredible, probably the best day of my life for riding. I hope today is the same, and we'll see how it goes. This whole area is just so unbelievably beautiful, so it should be good. Good morning, welcome to Hadanga. Just going along a lovely little road right now, and this is where they grow a lot of beautiful fruit for Norway. I'm just going through a cherry farm right now. It's pretty damn cool just seeing all the cherries on the trees. And ooh, 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 I can buy some if I want. If only I could carry them, I would. They look absolutely delicious. I love this as well about Norway. You can just pay by card as well. Just put your details in on the app and pay by card. God, Norway, so advanced. <laughs> Oops, as they call it. <sighs> Whoa. Monster climb in the Hedanga Fjord. Absolute monster climb. I think about the summit now. About to descend. This should be quite fun. All right. Let's do this. So we take the ferry back over to the north side and we come to a town called Norheinsun and from there we reach road number 7 again. Now you may remember road 7 from day 3. We join back on it and it's just 75 kilometers to Bergen. So close yet so far. You see this part of road 7 is what I like to call death road 7. And there are many reasons for that. First and foremost, there are 11 tunnels on the route. And most of them don't meet the safety requirements for cycling. Then you add in a 16 kilometer, 464 meters climb. with a gradient of over 30% in places. <clears throat> uh, 
And lastly, did you miss it? Let's go back. See it now? You see, normally, all over Norway, they have these fantastic signs that warns drivers to share the road with cyclists. But on Death Road 7, they like to make it a little bit harder. And this road can be very busy. Cars are traveling at quite some speed. Now the first four tunnels are what I consider to be the hardest part of this road. The tunnels are old, which means they're narrow and dark, and they have turns and corners in them. And sadly, cyclists have lost their lives in these tunnels. Now I had planned to go around them. I get there, each passage is completely blocked. Giving me just one option. When I reach tunnel number two, it was even worse. I've got my lights on, I've got a reflective jacket on, and I'm cycling as close as I can to the white line. Because I feel that if a driver doesn't see me, then the closer I am to the wall, the less chance I'm going to get hit. All it takes for a driver is that lapse in concentration. If you pull out your phone, to mess around with the radio, to look down for a few seconds as you go around the corner, traveling at 70 kilometers an hour, and it could be game over for me. As a cyclist, you have no idea what is approaching you. The vibrating noise is so deafening. It could be a bus, a truck, or just a car. All you can do is hold your handlebars tightly and brace for some turbulence as the vehicles hopefully pass you by safely. After tunnel number two, I am psychologically messed up. And I said, I'm like bollocks to this. I'm gonna go and take these routes that are being blocked off. At tunnel number three, I picked up my bike and managed to get it over the barriers and went around the tunnel. But I entered this kind of post-apocalyptic world with debris everywhere. But somehow I managed to get my bike through it and on towards number four. Unfortunately, the route around Tunnel 4 was completely blocked and I had to go through it. I'm just so glad them tunnels are over. I thought after Tunnel 4, I was over the worst, but you continue to climb and the road gets more narrow. The bus goes past you and gives you like less than a meter space. Your bike's shaking all over the show from the draft. Heart's still racing. So we continue to climb and I reach tunnel number five. Yes, it's gonna get me around this tunnel. Thank fuck for that. But my excitement was short lived because now I have to cross over this busy road with a dark tunnel right in front of me. <laughs> Perhaps Batman can help me. Before crossing the road, you stop at the curb. Look right. Look left. Look right again. And then only if the road is clear, walk quickly across. Thanks, Batman, but you didn't mention anything about tunnels. And what I didn't see was two little white lights heading out of the tunnel. And it's at this point when I realized the car was coming. But you've got the momentum, you're moving, so if I applied the brakes now, I would stop in the middle of the road with a very heavy bike, which is even more dangerous. So I only have one option, to cycle as fast as I can to the other side of the road. Cycle, 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 cycle. One, two. Now you can see the brake lights. That might have given me the two seconds. Smart. Be safe. Oh my god. Always do your curb drill. Not something I want to be doing every day, that's for sure. Not something I want to be doing every year, to be honest with you. 12 kilometers an hour. At this point, I'm getting really frustrated. I'm traveling at 12 kilometers an hour. It's incredibly warm. I'm both physically and mentally exhausted and cars are constantly flying past me 
this is not the place you want to be. All I can do is stay focused, keep calm, and carry on. I have to say, so be careful, uh, rocks are falling. Trust me, after experiencing them tunnels, I will take my chances with rocks over cars any day. So tunnel number six, we went around. But finally, after 16 kilometers of climbing, the descent was here. This road had broke me, both mentally and physically, but now the tables had turned. Kilometers and kilometers of descent now lay ahead. Nice cool breeze cooling me down. 60 kilometers an hour. 65 kilometers an hour. Pushing up to 70 kilometers an hour. The road was mine and no one was going to overtake me. And in fact, I began to catch up with the traffic. Get out of my way. But the hard work was not over quite yet. This was it, the last tunnel I had to go through on Death Road 7. I had a little check, but it seemed like I couldn't get around it. I had to go through. to go through. This time we were descending and ironically with speed comes safety. Road 7, complete. When I came off Death Road 7, there was a big sigh of relief. My shoulders could finally relax breathe once again as I now was on the safety of a cycle path. That was a very, very tough stretch of road and I was very pleased it was over. So this is what I looked like after Death Road 7, like some abandoned dog. Just put me down man, put me down. What a very tough last few hours it's been. So this is it, day six nearly over. I need some rest, but I've got a couple hours to finally get to my destination. The last 25 kilometers were pretty smooth sailing after Death Road 7, and there was some nice scenery along the way. When I reached the campsite, I literally fell asleep outside my tent. I was that exhausted. I can honestly say that is by far the hardest day bikepacking I have ever done.
very tough with the bag as well. But let's do it. Where did that come from? 